In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, up to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for him, them in the inn. Good morning again, guys. Good morning. If you are a guest with us, we welcome you, and are thrilled that you're with us. Uh, my name is Tom Hypes. I'm the pastor here at the church. And we have a really interesting Sunday that we have everything coming together all at once, don't we? Uh, if you are a fellowship or one that kind of calls this church home, you've been with us over a journey for the last month of going through Advent, which is that period of time from Thanksgiving to, to now, to Christmas, where we're preparing ourselves with anticipation so that we're ready for the celebration. And we've been doing that through stories. We've been sharing testimonies during our Advent time together from different people within the church of how they have found hope, love, joy, and peace, and how we lean into those things to be able to have the life that God has called us to. And we've also been doing that through the different narratives of the, uh, the narrative of the nativity. We will talk about Mary and Joseph, and we talked about shepherds as well as the wise men. And we kind of recapped some of that last night as we had our Christmas Eve Eve gathering. And if you, if you weren't here last night, I'm sorry you missed it. It was a really neat night uh, for, for those that are here. It was just what an incredible night it was. And the string orchestra, was, uh, the kids from River Valley were just incredible to work with. And all the volunteers that brought their, their, their time and their sweat and their blood to the mix and the special music and just everything from beginning to end. The visitors, everything that we had was just a beautiful night. But this morning's really kind of the time to transition into the celebration of Christmas. So with that, we have saved three stories. Three stories for you. Two from the scripture and one from within our church family that um, I'm really kind of excited to, to be able to have shared with you today as we see these things come together. So let's dig into the ones from the Christmas narrative first as we go into Luke chapter 2. So unlike last night, let's get our Bibles out. I told you I hated doing that last night, but Get our Bibles out. We're going to Luke chapter 2. We're going to start out in verse 25. If you do not have a Bible and would like to follow along, there are Bibles in the baskets underneath the chairs around the room. Uh, and then also there's you version. If you have that app on your phone or your tablet that you can pull up today's schedule and have all the Bible verses right there for you, place to take notes and leave prayer requests. But for today, we're going to be digging into the stories of two people, Simeon and Anna. Now, if, depending on your church background and you're growing up, or uh, just depending on your history or whatnot, you might not know a lot about Simeon, you might not know a lot about Anna. Uh, their stories are not necessarily always attributed into the nativity. It's not like you get out baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph and the wise men and the shepherds and pull out your little statue of Simeon and your little statue of Anna. They, you know, a, lot, a lot of times within tradition, it's not hit a lot. We like to hit it a lot here because they're actually a lot closer to the nativity than the wise men were. And they're very much part of the story when it comes to the anticipation of Joseph and Mary as well as the anticipation of the Jewish community themselves. So we're going to do what we usually do. We're going to read a little, talk a little, and see what we find within their two stories as another two great examples of anticipation when Jesus came in the physical form to fulfill all those prophecies that we were talking about last night within the scripture. The first part is finding, well, both of those all happens in one particular case where Jesus is parents, Mary and Joseph, are taking him to the temple to be dedicated. And this is something that just would have been part of the law at the time. Uh, the time for the baby dedication. Baby dedications, I love baby dedications. I love when we have baby dedications here at the church. This is his time. This is something that was within the law to dedicate the firstborn son to the Lord. And certainly you want to do that with the Messiah. That makes a lot of sense, right? So they're going to the synagogue to do something that every other family, every other set of parents that are Jewish, that are following the law, have done for thousands of years. So from their standpoint, this is, this is a great moment, it's a baby dedication, but there's not anything overly unique to it. It's not like shepherds coming into the barn and saying, you won't believe what we just had happen. It's not like them themselves seeing the angels in the midst of their crazy story. This is just kind of a normal day. Things are getting back to normal. We're doing what we're supposed to do. And God says, well, let me mess with that a little bit too. So as they come into the synagogue, we find that the first person that comes up to them is Simeon. Verse 25. It says, there's a man in Jerusalem, not a man that Mary and Joseph knew, but a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. 
And the Bible tells us that the man was righteous and he was devout. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he seen the Lord's Christ. That's a pretty good resume in just a couple sentences of just how, what this guy's got going on. He's righteous, he's following God, he's following the law, he, he loves the Lord, he's devoted, very devoted. The Holy Spirit was with him, which again is something that I think we tend to take for granted today living in the church age, because if you accept Jesus as leader and forgiver in your life, by acknowledging with your mouth he's the Son of God, and believing in your heart he died and rose again, and you give your life to him, that part of God that we call the Holy Spirit resides within you, is with us, that's not Old Testament living. That happened after Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit's very active. The Holy Spirit's very communal. We see him through the whole Old Testament. But he's not thought of in a personal way outside of the greats, just like what we saw with Mary when it came to being highly favored, that the Lord was with her. Simeon has the Holy Spirit with him. That's a big statement to find at the beginning of Luke. That, this guy's a hero of the faith. He's righteous. No one's ever heard of him, but he's a hero of the faith. He's righteous, he's devoted, and the Spirit has seen fit to promise him that he will not die until he sees Christ himself. Do you remember last night when we were talking about that big old timeline? We had like a string, it was talking about the thousands of years before and something in the beginning and going to, um, you know, up to the, the prophets and how there's that, that 400 years of silence before Jesus was born to the Old Testament, New Testament. A lot of people stopped anticipating. They believed the Messiah would come someday, but they started to kind of take him for granted. Kind of like what we do today, again, with the second coming of Jesus. It's going to happen someday, but I'm not living my day like it's going to happen today. They just kind of lost their anticipation. Again, that's a mistake on our part. I'm not, I'm not glorifying that. This guy wasn't doing that. This guy had a promise where the Holy Spirit said, you will not die until you see the Messiah. And he was living with that level of anticipation of what was to come. So by leaning in the Spirit, being righteous, in verse 27, we see that he came in the Spirit into the temple. And the parents, at the same time that the parents brought in the child Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law. And he took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God. So have you ever had that moment where it feels like the Holy Spirit's telling you to do something and you're not sure if you're supposed to do it or not? You know what I mean? Like, is that really the Holy Spirit, or is that just me kind of psyching myself out? I do that way too much. And I, I've gotten to the point that I've learned that usually nine out of ten times it was the Spirit. In the tenth time, like, worst case scenario is I got a little egg on my face and it's not that big a deal. At least I said, oh, golly, look, I tried too hard. Um, but nine out of ten times, it really is the Spirit. And I, I just had this the other day. I was over at... Um, Brookdale nursing home, and that's one of the nursing homes I used to teach at. I taught there for six and a half years, and it's one of the nursing homes I retired from at the end of summer, and I hadn't really been back, um, mostly because a new person came in to start teaching, and when you're dealing with um, some of the limitations and challenges of, uh, of folks, uh, you, consistency matters. And so for the old guy to be coming in going, hey, what's going on or whatnot, really detracts from what the new person is doing. And so I, I, sp I wanted to spend some time away from it, but I used the, the, the excuse of the, the card ministry team here at the church did cards for nursing homes and for the homeless shelters and Tony Point. And so I, I, I used that as an opportunity to go back over. And I just dropped off cards, and I was just going to leave. I didn't really want to, again, cause any kind of bumps. And I got halfway across the parking lot, and I just really felt like, no, go back in and talk to Bob. And Bob's one of the residents. I love Bob. love Bob to, to death. But I'm like, but now I'm halfway to my car. You, know, you, you guys know what I'm do, talking about, right? This is the way we think. How about you call? This particular facility has like a security type thing that you have to go through, and you have to call staff on the other side of the building to come over to let you in. And I just did that to drop out the cards, and now they're going to think this joke is back within 30 seconds, and we had to come all the way back again and all this stuff. It, but I've learned you just lean into it. Just lean into it. So I went back in, and they were gracious enough let me go back in. And I'll tell you, I just was really blessed by that 20 minutes of Bob. Follow those promptings by the Holy Spirit. Just follow those promptings by the Holy Spirit. You just never know what God's going to do with it. In this case, he was looking at the Spirit, and the Spirit says, hey, why don't you go over to the synagogue? Well, why am I going to the synagogue? Just go to the synagogue. He leans into it, and he walks in the same moment as Mary and Joseph with the baby, and the Holy Spirit says, there. There is the fulfillment of the promise that you've been waiting on. And he goes over, and he snatches the kid, and I'm thinking Mary and Joseph are probably freaking out just a little bit by that. 
And he lifts up the child and he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people of Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about Jesus. And so again, in this moment, as he's been living by hope, love, joy, peace, as he's been leaning into the promise, not giving up, holding on to the anticipation, here's his moment. And if you listen to his words... Though not worldly. Now I can die in peace. It's not now I lived. Now I can die in peace. I'm resolved to what comes next. I know that's the next part of the story, but in this moment I have the fulfillment of the promise and it's glorious. And I'm holding the Messiah in my hands. And he's not just here for the Jewish people. This is something that's unheard of within the gospel period of time. They were God's chosen people. He's coming for us. He's like, no, I get it. It's bigger than that. This is good news that brings great joy for all the people, for the Gentiles and for the Jews alike. And Mary and Joseph once again have another moment to ponder, another moment of confirmation that Jesus Christ has come, that the Messiah is here. Now, as if that wouldn't be enough for them to go with, if you jump down to verse 36 with me, we have a second testimony. In this case, it's not a man of faith, it's a woman of faith. It's one of the heroes of our faith by the name of Anna. It says, there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, maybe, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. I love this story. And you guys kind of stop and do some of the math to kind of get an idea of what her life was like. If we go back to our talk about Mary, and that in this culture at this time, generally women got married about the age, somewhere between 13, 17 years old, 12 and 17 years old, that if if Anna followed culture, she was married, she was with her husband for seven years, so now we're putting her at what, 22, 24 years old? He passes away, And instead of scrambling to find a new husband or following the law to marry one of his relatives to stay within the family line, she says, I'm content with my Lord. I'm content with my Lord. And again, this is one of those things we have to kind of keep in mind. We're not placed on this earth to have a spouse. That's not the ultimate goal. I'm married. I love my wife. Everything's great and grand. But that's not the ultimate goal. We don't have to be married to be complete. Our completion comes in Christ or else you're not ready for marriage anyways. So here she is, she just says, I'm giving my life to the Lord. And she moves into the church. We now have to take the staff office, move everything out, put in a bedroom because Anna's now living at the church. She's going to be there all the time. And she's going to live a life that makes me look like such an immature, puny little Christian boy where she is constantly praying, fasting, seeking, learning, running after God. And she is gifted with a voice, a voice of God. She's a prophetess. And so as this happens with Simeon, as he pulls Jesus out of the hands and he's holding him up and he's singing this great song, Anna comes running over in the spirit. And she does not necessarily take it in for herself as much as she starts taking it in for everybody else. And she starts saying, everybody listen to me. This is the moment. Everybody listen to me. This is the child. This is the Messiah. This is the fulfillment of the promises. This is what we've been anticipating. This is God. Jesus. And I am confident that many people in the synagogue thought they were crazy. I'm confident a lot of people did not sign on. We see that within the religious leaders of the time. We see it within the Pharisees. We see it within the Sadducees. But for those who are anticipating, believing, living by faith, leaned in, and it changed everything. But they would not be able to receive the light if they weren't hopeful, understood that God loved them, filled with joy, protected by peace. So let's talk about those. Scott, if you would put just those up on the screen a little bit. I want to look at those a little bit differently with you 
this week as we go into Christmas. Because here's, here's the challenge I think we sometimes have, is when we look at Christmas and we look at, bless you, uh, hope and love and joy and peace, I think we look at them in kind of a mild manner way. They're like the Clark Kent version of what we go into, like, you know, Oh, oh Holy Night or Silent Night or uh, a lot of the songs that we love and cherish about just kind of the, the mild manner end of things. Um, and I, I want to suggest to you today, and I kind of tipped my cards a little bit last week when I was talking about joy on this because it just felt like the Spirit wanted to say it. But I want to suggest that it might do us some, some good if we saw the four of these as weapons that we have been given by our God to protect the life of freedom that he desires for us. That these are things that are not just supposed to be mild-mannered and not our Christmas cards and the kills, but it's things that we hold on to. There are errors in our quiver that we have to fight the enemy who tries to steal from us everything that Jesus gave us when we come to him at the manger for the first time. Um, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. And Scott, I'm going to need your assistance with this as we go. But, but when we look at hope, Hope truly is really the weapon that we have when it comes to, Scott, if you will go to the next one, when it comes to uh, abandonment. That is the main thing that hope is there to help us fight against. When we feel stressed out, maxed out, when you're sitting there with your checkbook or you're sitting there looking at a relationship that is falling apart in front of you, and we lose hope, is it not truly a sense that God has abandoned us? That God does not care. That God is not in control. It is our hope that lets us combat that to the point of realizing that's not the case at all. It tells us, and we'll put this on the screen for you as well, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no the heart of man imagine, God has prepared for us who loved him. There's more than what we could possibly imagine, God's prepared for you. In those moments when everything seems like it's falling apart and you don't know how this could possibly ever get fixed, when you lean into the Lord, He's got something great for you that you have not even thought about yet. And I'm telling you, I can tell you in testimonies of my life where God has done more than I ever deserved by far and oftentimes a lot more than I imagined in the moment. We look at things six months down the road, 12 months down the road, and if you're the world, you say, well, time changes things. I'm telling you, when I look at my testimonies, time did nothing. As I've seen a lot of people go through time and end up more bitter, more in pain, more angry, more afraid. It is my Lord. It is my hope that lets me say to Satan, you don't get to play here. This is not your playground. If we go to love, love really is a weapon against the feeling of indifference. When I think that God does not love me, and again, that was the main focus that we had. It's not whether or not I have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's the love of my God that we focused on because I truly don't believe that we can celebrate Christmas to its fullness unless we understand God loves you. And when we get to those places where we think that no one cares or that he has forgotten us or he has drawn away from us, we believe that God has become indifferent about us. That he doesn't really care about what's going on in my life right now. He doesn't really care about me. Or maybe God is so busy with everybody else that he just doesn't have time to focus in on me. Or I've heard people say, well, yeah, I'm going through some stuff, but I don't want to bother with it because you're a pastor and I know people have it worse than I do. It's not a game. It's not a competition. Whether or not you're coming to him with some major life-changing situation or you feel like it's a major life situation that your cat passed away, it's all in his spectrum of going, I care about that. I love you. As I'm looking through the scripture, I'll tell you, and, and we saw the, this, uh, I, I don't know, Sylvia, are you still in the room? Hey, baby. Uh, I, I noticed a Facebook thread that another pastor in town was doing, Josh, uh, and he was asking people for their favorite um, Christmas scriptures, and, and Amanda shared a, a great one, and I uh, took note of that. I, I didn't share mine, but, but mine would probably have to be John 3.16. And I know it's one of the most popular verses, and I know it's probably the first memory verse that most of us memorize, unless if you're cheating and went with Jesus wept. But really, when you stop and you pause, holy cow, for God so loved you, me, the world, that he gave his only 
begotten Son. And I don't know if you fully ever get that unless if you have children yourself. So that we should not perish, but that we can have everlasting life. Everything he has ever done from the beginning of the book to the day that we live in today is constantly moving for reconciliation, protection, and freedom for people and for you. Love is that weapon against that feeling of of indifference that God does not care. If we go to joy, joy is the weapon that we have against discouragement. A little lighter. When you're in those motions of discouragement, these are starting to come together, so let me just kind of keep the pace going. When we look in 1 Peter 1, and and there's times when you feel like everything is falling apart, Peter reminds us that though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not um, see, though you do not see, now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Joy is never something that we have to manufacture. Joy is a natural response when you are living by faith. If you look at the last part of the line, it's the outcome of your faith. It's when we believe in what we hope for and we're certain of the things that we do not see. That's what Hebrews 11 tells us. Then you are living by faith. And when you're living by faith and you know that God's in charge of all things, joy is natural. So if Satan is stealing your joy, that's the area to start leaning into more. That's the weapon that you go to. And this is why I say peace goes with it. And there's a weapon that goes with this because peace is the weapon against distress. When we feel like everything is falling apart. Isaiah 26, 3 says this. And this is speaking to God. You keep him, you keep her in perfect peace whose mind is on you because they trust in you. If today you're coming into Christmas and maybe you've been here this entire month and you listen to testimonies and you've seen the stories and you've gone through things and you are overwhelmed and you are afraid or you are lonely or you think that things are just falling apart and there's no hope for you. What Isaiah tells us is it is a promise that he keeps you in perfect peace when your mind is upon him. When we are focusing on Him instead of the circumstances, when we're focusing on Him instead of our wants, when we're focusing on Him instead of the ways of the world, you keep our mind in peace. These are weapons. Last year I shared a story with you, and I think it's probably the third or fourth time I shared it with you, um, when it comes to Christmas. My sister's favorite sermon metaphor of all time. Not mine, but my sister's. I was at her house. We do Christmas Eve at my sister's place with our extended family. I'll be going there in a couple hours. And I remember it was several years ago, she, just out of the blue, we were talking about doing a Christmas Eve gathering. She goes, let me tell you my favorite um, sto- illustration or metaphor I've ever heard. She goes, back in college, I was listening to a pastor talk about Christmas. And he was talking about Jesus as the, the Lion of Judea. And she was talking about that when you, let's say you go to the zoo. I'm not sure. How many animal nuts do we have in the house? People like animals? Okay. Anybody hate cats? No. I'm sorry, Amanda. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was out. <laughs> Don't jump on my train wagon. You'll all be in trouble too. Um, but let's say you go to the zoo and they, they bring out this like little itty bitty lion cub, right? And that you, you can hold it, but a class trip or whatever the case may be. And you got this lion cub. That's going to be just a downright adorable moment, is it not? I mean, it's just going to be, you're, you're going to play with its mane. It doesn't look at you as food at this point. It's just a nice little moment that you get to play with the lion and maybe have your kids with you or some <laughs> friends with you or whatnot. And that's really what we do with Jesus. That's really what we see at Christmas time. It's the mild, it's the mannered, it's beautiful, it's sweet, it inspires. But as that lion grows, and the lion of Judea does grow, as it grows in your life, he no longer becomes tame, soft, play toy. He's ferocious. He's powerful. He's good, but he's ferocious. And you cannot contain him. And you cannot control him. All you can do is lean into him and enjoy the ride. When we make hope and love and joy and peace 
comfortable, cuddly, mild-mannered. We lose a lot of the power that we have through Jesus Christ to say, Satan, you are not stealing my freedom. You're not stealing my peace. You're not stealing my joy. You're not stealing my Christmas. It's about you. We see that in the life of Simeon. We see that in the life of Anna. But as I promised, I promised you one more. Tammy, would you be so kind? You'd be okay with the handheld? And I got you a chair. A chair. Caramel I'm going to sit right over here by you. What's that? Caramel latte. Caramel latte. I thought you were asking me for some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys do not know Tammy as of yet, I know several of you do, and I think you had some vineyard connections from back in the day and some different friendships here. Um, I know Tammy through her father, uh, John. John was one of my residents at one of the nursing homes who I love dearly. Um, John was uh, uh, an interesting bloke and funny, and, and I know he's got a, a big, long uh, life. It, for me, one of my, my favorite memories of John is he would like to call her in his later days. He would call her calling pages like kids do, and then he would take and frame them uh, and give them away. Emily has one of his framed art pieces at home in her bedroom that he gave her, um, and unfortunately we, we lost uh, John a few years back. And uh, through that, got to know you a little bit better, uh, but being blessed to officiate the, the, the funeral, and then on a more of a celebration, your wedding as well. So, um, so I've, I've known Tammy for a few years as, as well, but I want to make sure you guys get to know Tammy as well. She's been coming to the church now, I mean, pretty steady for the last mm-hmm. several months, and six, seven, eight months. And uh, she's going through a new season, as we all do. We all go through different seasons that we have. And um, that's what kind of will give you a couple seconds to talk about the season that you're in. Well, what's going on? Um, it was kind of in between Thanksgiving and the first of December. Um, I went in for a routine mammogram. Um, I was maybe about six months late going into it and everything, but it turned out that after about five tests, going to Stephanie Spielman uh, Comprehensive Breast Center. Um, that I have cancer and um, (laughs) my emotions are unpredictable (laughs) I can go from um, you know really being strong and just being myself to um, standing in line at the bank and starting to cry I didn't bring any tissue so I can't do this (laughs) box we got somebody for you so anyway, um, it was, uh, you know, in itself, uh, it kind of threw me for a loop for a few days. Um, and I started gaining some ground, you know, trying to, um, you know, sort things out, kind of regroup, um, not let that define me. Um, the complicated thing about the diagnosis, too, um, going for uh, bilateral mastectomy. So there'll be reconstruction and everything. It's gonna be in January. I'll have to have chemo and all that. But I also have a husband who is at home on life support. <laughs> it's a full box here for me. <laughs> and um, I am one of his, I'm his main caregiver. I have somebody comes uh, while I, I'm still working. Um, you know, over the last year, I haven't felt that good, but he had resp- respiratory failure about a year ago, so there's been a lot of stress. Um, and uh, cancers in my life in other ways than physical, you know, that I have been dealing with. Do you want me to not That's detail? Fully up to you. But, That's fully up to you, story, um, sweet. So, yeah, as I'm going through this and as, you know, uh, Tom uh, has kept in contact with me by kind of prodding me a little bit, hey, kid, how you doing, once in a while, on messages and everything, um, I have shared with him, uh, you know, uh, details of, um, I'm going to call it a a different kind of cancer that was in my life. And... um, uh, he invited me, uh, you know, pretty much encouraged me. We had tech, uh, messaged a little bit, 
And then he basically, um, you know, it was like, you know how you message somebody and you think you're done? Well, then I look at my phone like a half an hour or so later and I see that Tom messaged me again and just really encouraged me to be at the service last Sunday. Um, and at that time, I was dealing not only with, you know, the news of the breast cancer and everything that comes with that, but I was also dealing with a lot of personal issues that I am looking at as a type of cancer in my life also as far as how you know, I was um, uh, receiving them, dealing with them. So I came last week, and I listened to, where's Dale? There you are. Um, listened to Dale's testimony. Um, and I was reminded uh, through his testimony of how I stood with my mom when she was taking her last breath and how I had prayed. I had begged God, but I didn't get my way. But then when it was at the end, just like Dale, you know, it's like you're begging God to take her because you know that it's better than what we're going through here on earth. And so it was like, <laughs> I was thinking this morning how it was like, I felt like God just, I mean, I knew better. I mean, why did I have to be reminded, you know, of who God was? I knew who he was. He uses the evil or the wicked for a day of evil. He lets it rain on the just and the unjust. He lets the sun shine on both of us. But where's the difference? You know, where is the difference? He wants us to be that difference. He doesn't, you know, want us just to love people that love us. He wants us to love the unlovable. He wants to walk up, us to walk up to people that are the unapproachable, unapproachable and approach them because God's ways are opposite of our ways. His world is totally turned upside down from the way ours is. So when Dale said that she got to the point that she said, God is here, right? For those two words, God is here. And I'm going, you know, I thought I've real, I was really smart, <laughs> you know, but it's like, you know, I just felt like God gave me a boot in the backside, you know, and that I, it's not that I hadn't realized before, but I guess it's just, like Tom said, a new season, you know, it's a new time. And I thought, man, you know, I thought about all of us, don't we like to win, you know, if you, uh, a uh, football fan or whatever, you like your team to win. No matter what you're doing, playing chess, playing your games on your phone. We like to win. But guess what? We win. <laughs> you know, we win. And that's what I got out of what Dale said, you know, that morning. is like, why am I worried about all the mud in my life? God took mud and healed the blind. You know, that's our God. He took the mud and healed the blind. So, you know, I'm going, all the stuff, all the details of everything, not the personal physical cancer that I had at that time, but more than that was bothering me was these other things. And I thought, why am I worried? I win. You know, because God wins. Because his hope his love, his peace, his joy. Grant, the song you sang, when you said peace on earth, when you sang peace on earth, I thought it's God's peace on earth. It's not the way men see it, you know? It's not the way, you know, everybody looks at things. I've been in the healthcare field. I've been with people that have passed. I've been with people that aren't Christians. 
And you know this one lady that I was with that was an atheist? I, after she passed, I knew about her life and everything, but I didn't feel her life anymore. When my mom passed, when she laid there and she said yes, she had fought. It was, hospice said it was like the worst that they had ever seen. It was upsetting to them. She did not want to go. She did not want to leave her children. And so at the end though, she was saying yes. You know, she was, she was at peace. She settled down and she was shaking her yet head yes. And you knew that she was seeing something that we couldn't. When she was gone, oh, it was the greatest feeling ever. I held her hand when she drew her last breath. And I could feel her presence, her spirit. You know, I could feel her life because she was alive in heaven. You know, and... Um, but I messaged Tom. I'm kind of on a rabbit trail here. But You're fine, dude. I messaged Tom, um, and it was, he talked about getting nudged. Well, it's kind of late, and I'm thinking, you know, and my mind just wasn't settled because of some things that have been said to me. So um, it was about 10.30 or so, and I was like, no, I better not message him this late, you know. He probably gets a lot of that. <laughs> Do you mind if I talk about that no. a little bit? Oh, I'm okay. I've got this little oh, golf sorry. books okay. thing going. Um, <laughs> no, was we, we we were talking again middle of this week, and um, when Tammy was talking about being nudged, there was a cu- couple of little nudges I had to invite Tammy to speak uh, this week and share her story. And um, it was one of those things I kind of fought with a little bit because I knew everything that's going on in Tammy's life right now and putting something else on her. Or, um, there's a kind of, kind of notes about I was praying about it and she sent me an email this time and um, I won't go in, in real depth of a lot of things that you said but if, if you trust me just for a second or two the email um, blew me away it, it basically was from a heart of a woman that again that, that I know and I know what else you're talking about when you're talking about the other cancers as well as the physical things that are on your plate right now as well as what's on your husband's plate and has been for many years and continues to worsen, to get an email from somebody who says, um, is it wrong to want to stay and not lose a fight to cancer? Is it, is it wrong to not want my kids to have to go through that, what I went through with my mother? But at the same time, pray, I want your will, not mine. And for me to take, again, it's not a contest who's going through the worst things, but if it was, she wins. And <laughs> I'm reading that, and I'm just, that is the heart of Jesus in the garden when he says, I don't want to take the cross, Father, but not my will, but yours be done. And that's exactly what God wants from us. That's why we went through why Mary had challenges, and Joseph had challenges, and the shepherds had challenges, and the wise men had challenges, and stripped away some of the, the legend aspect of it is because when we can't relate to them, we feel guilty somehow for the times that we're crying in the bank. And guys, there's going to be times that we're crying at the bank. But when it comes back to Jesus, and it comes back to using the weapons that we have with hope and love and joy and peace, giving each other our testimonies, we absolutely, like, like Tim just said, why did I have to hear it from somebody else when I already knew it? That's probably because we have testimonies to encourage each other and to remind ourselves and brings all these things together. And I was like, wow, you, where you're at right now um, is really where we're striving to be. We're striving to be at that place where we could say, I can rest in your will, Father. I can rest in your will. So I thank you for sharing today, kiddo. You're welcome. Will you do me a favor, though? What's that? Let me take this out of your hand so you can do it. See those candles? Oh, yeah. Those are the four things that we were talking about, that, but that white one is all about that Jesus is here and that we can put our faith in him. And I can't imagine anybody better to light that for the last time for us this, this Christmas season. You got to push the safety on the top, bottom, put in a code, facial recognition, but Jesus has come. Can we pray over Tammy? And I purposely left some space behind us. Does anybody that would like to come up and lay hands on Tammy? You're more than welcome to. 
If you want to pray from your chair, you can as well. But at this point, if you want to come up, just don't knock over the candles. <laughs> and we'll be good to go. But I just want to pray over my sister. Thank you so much for sharing today, Kim. I appreciate it. Love you. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the friendship and the history and the celebrations and the remembrances that you have gifted me with my sister. I thank you, Father, for the blessing of her choosing to spend time and be with us here at the fellowship, to not let the things of this world, including a distance, holy cow, this girl drives almost an hour to get to church and come so she can be in fellowship with her brothers and sisters, that she can worship, that she can learn. And Father, I'm thankful for the moving of your spirit through testimonies, through your word, through relationship, Father, that encourage one another. And in this moment, Father, I lift up to you what you already know. I know you are painfully aware and nowhere near indifferent to the struggles that's on Tammy's plates. And I know that you're aware of the other cancers. I know that you're aware of the physical situation she's going through now. I know that you're aware of the five appointments that she had yesterday that makes her tired, but yet she still comes to share her story this morning. And I know you see a young woman who believes in you, trusts you, hopes in you, and leans into you. And I pray that is where she finds her power, through the Holy Spirit that resides within her as a child of the risen King. I'm convinced that nothing can rob from her, take from her, while her mind is on the things of her Lord. So, Father, when it comes to these challenges, I know that you have the power and the authority, if it is your will, to immediately take these off of her plate and make it a testimony of a miracle, a miracle of healing, a, a miracle of relationships being mended, and of a family being pulled back together. You have that power. You have that authority, if it is your will. I know there's also some free will decisions in there and some of the things I prayed about that, that people have choices over. But when it comes to you and Tammy, I know she's leaning into you. But again, not our will, but yours be done. And every step of whatever path is in front of her, may she know that she's got her family be behind her here at the Shepherd's Fellowship and that we are here for her in any way, shape, or form that we can to be able to minister and to love and to be able to laugh and to cry together. And may she know that she lives and stands victorious no matter what circumstances come and whatever they may be on the firm foundation of the rock of Jesus Christ who always wins. I thank you for her heart, and I thank you for her testimony, and I pray, Father, that each one of us here today are minister to and grow from it. And we worship you and thank you, and may all the glory go to your name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.